Hey, it's Rob Potash with CSMI, and welcome to episode number eight of Isokinetics 101. Uh, up till now, we've been talking about using the Cybex machine for training, which is 90% of the use. Today, we're going to get into isokinetic testing, and Daniel and John are going to introduce to something called interrupted stroke testing, which is a little unique to most users unless you've used the Kincom in the past. So, Daniel and John, it's your turn. Thanks, John, Rob. How are you tonight? I'm uh, doing great, well. Daniel. How are you, man? Doing well. We can't complain, can we? No, Life is living good. Living the dream. Living the dream. That is very true. So I'm really excited. Um, tonight we're gonna kind of we're gonna hear from John about what he has made, uh, or what he's really helped create with this uh, the eccentric testing, interrupted stroke test, and he gets really excited talking about it. I remember being a student and uh, hearing this lecture for the first time, and then. When I did an internship with John, I'd you know get bits and pieces of it here and there, but I haven't seen it go from start to finish. And uh, gosh, since 2016, since I moved from Florida. So I'm really excited to see it again tonight and to hear from John and uh, kind of catch myself up as well. Are you ready to go, John? Oh, we're always ready. Okay. How about you, Daniel? I am. So I'm going to mute myself uh and let you take off. Well, thank you very much. And quite honestly, Daniel has kind of led this entire approach and continues to lead this and has done some phenomenal educational formatting for us, uh, developing videos and interactive teaching modules that we can all utilize. So he's taking some of the concepts that um, we came up with and he's kind of advancing those and that's exactly what we want. Uh, we want to see him kind of move forward with each one of these aspects and make sure that things are going well. Um, so we want to get on with this just a little bit. I'm having just an issue with it advancing. So let me skip out and come back in and see if that works a little bit better. There we go. So you guys know that in the past, uh, this is number eight, so we've done seven of these all together. Talked about the history and the science of isokinetics. We've done demonstrations across the board. So we've looked at passive, isometric, isokinetic, isotonic. We even talked about testing in the isometric standpoint. So tonight it's really taking isokinetic testing uh, from a concentric, concentric in what we might term a non-functional mode to a more functional mode of testing. Now, next month we're going to come back and we're actually going to have, Daniel's going to do concentric, concentric testing and kind of um, add on some things uh, that we may not cover tonight, depending on the amount of time that we actually have. But let's get back to those very functional types of things that we're talking about. Remember, what we're measuring for the most part is either force or torque. And force is a very simple physics problem. Force equals mass times acceleration. It's a function of tension that's created by the muscle. So it can be converted by torque if you know the distance from the axis of rotation. So while we know force is either read as either pounds or newtons, torque is read as foot pounds or newton meters. So again, torque is just a force times the distance from the axis of rotation. So depending on the type of isokinetic machine that you may be using, you may be getting a force curve or a torque curve. Again, the difference is just distance from the axis of rotation for torque. So what are the other things that we really have to kind of pay attention to? Well, everyone's heard of peak torque, and that's the maximum value associated. Uh, it's been used on most of the older machines for a long period of time. It's probably the most used. Uh, measurement in passive systems. And again, passive systems are the older systems that kind of held on to that high end speed, but they weren't active in nature, which is the ones that we're using today. Again, work is force times distance. And again, it's distance of rotation kind of gives us uh, information that we're looking to for work. And then if we want to go to power, it's really work over time. Uh, so they're all just mathematical equations that we can work on. So we have force, we have work, we have power, and then we can start to look at other types of things like peak power, work performed during the best repetition or the best work repetition. And again, some people like to look at endurance or the ability to reproduce force repetitively over a series of contractions or time. Now, we can argue certain aspects about it that maybe endurance isn't 50% of what your maximum aspect is. Uh, but those are kind of discussions that we'll have down the line. 
One of the most important things for us to really pay attention to is total work. And total work is the area underneath the tor curve, torque curve and the, by the angular displacement. Now, from, from Europe, they often call this um, an angular measurement that they're looking for. But we really look at it as total work is the area underneath the torque curve. So again, you know isometric, it's our ability to produce maximal static force. It kind of reveals the amount of tension that a muscle can generate against a fixed resistance with a fixed speed, zero speed. Isotonics is a fixed or constant load with variable speed, but isokinetics is a constant speed variable res resistance. So an isokinetic dynamometer controls the velocity of a limb by a preset variable speed governing mechanism. As more force is exerted against the lever arm of the dynamometer, the energy of the moving limb is absorbed by the apparatus and converted to increased resistance to maintain a constant predetermined speed. So one of the aspects that we should pay attention to is often when we talk about that length tension uh, relationship. And again, it's often referred to as an association between the length of the muscle and the tension it produces. It's been described as a position when the greatest number of cross bridges between the actin and myosin filaments of the fibers occur. And that goes all the way back to early muscle physiology concepts. Muscle tension that corresponds to a, a maximal active tension is known as the muscle length, a resting length, which isn't to be confused with a joint resting position. So for an example, with the knee joint, we know that the maximum forces when measured seated typically occur at 60 degrees of knee flexion for the extensor muscles, the quadriceps, and about 30 degrees in knee flexion for the flexor muscles, the hamstrings. So starting positions for exercises should make use of the resting length to develop force production, especially with a weak structure. It allows the position for optimal loading. It's desirable to have the resting length incorporated in the range of motion in the exercise and testing sequence. So when we're testing, and especially when we talk about exercise, it's not a bad idea for us to kind of incorporate some of this length tension relationships and making sure that we're at least loading them at their maximum uh, positions and be able to functionally train them more appropriately. So the other thing that people often talk about is load range. And that's the time spent in the isokinetic mode as re is typically referred to as the load range. So early passive machines could only control the top end speed. So the ice connect uh, exercise or test only occurred in the region that the speed was maintained. As speeds increased, the load range became a little bit smaller because less activity occurred in the ice connect mode. So we had to ramp up and, and decrease away from that. Active machines, on the other hand, are designed to maintain the speed of movement even if the resistance is not matched through the range of motion. And they employ a ramping acceleration phase and a deceleration phase at the end point of the range of motion. And that can be adjusted to accommodate for the type of activities and individuals you're assessing. So again, that, that, that ramping speed becomes important for us to utilize with people that may have uh, early dysfunction that we're trying to train in a very light area versus our athletes which are very, who are very high functioning. The other terminology that we used to hear about that we're not going to go over as aggressively when we talk about interrupted stroke technique are, are uh, moment artifacts, which basically serve to challenge the reliability and validity of ice kinetic use. As the acceleration occurred up to the predetermined speed, the dynamometer slowed you down, and it wasn't unusual that you would see this little bit of a, a, a moment artifact. Some people often refer to that as an overshoot. So as the speed slowed to a preset velocity, the spike's kind of shown to increase as the speed increases. And again, there's a difference between acceleration torque overshoot and a deceleration spike. Now, again, most manufacturers with active systems can reduce this with what they call smoothing or windowing. So you don't see as many of the, of the uh, moment artifacts or overshooting as we used to see in days past. So what about validity and reliability of isokinetics. Well, we've kind of known that uh, several studies have, have, have been conducted assessing the reliability and validity, uh, but we can also look at the calibration mode for testing the mechanical reliability 
By utilizing a known weight on the load cell and measuring the time it requires to move through an unknown distance at a specific velocity. So it gives us an opportunity to actually look at a calibration as well as the validity and reliability. So there are a few areas that we should pay attention to in order to make sure that reproducibility factors don't cause some errors if we don't reproduce them correctly. And a couple of things to really kind of talk about very briefly is subject motivation. Now, obviously, if we have somebody who's uncooperative, if they're non-compliant, uh, it can be a little tough to do a very valid test and reproduce their ability to produce force. But then also fatigue and pain can also be areas that, that cause some problems for us. Improper setup, so testing procedure errors on one area that we need to make sure that we standardize so that we have a proper setup and a proper protocol so that we're not having consistent inconsistencies, if that makes sense. So standardize your, your, your procedures, the number of reps, the rest period that you give them, you know, whether or not you're going to give them verbal or visual assistance um, so that you, you eliminate any of those inconsistencies between tester and testee. And then finally, you know, tester experience or lack of experience can be a problem. You heard Daniel say that in the past, I've always talked about everyone doing the whole sequence at least 10 times. And I really believe that's important when we do a test. We want to really make sure that we're practicing these test procedures, you know, significantly so that you feel comfortable moving through each sequence correctly. So again, inner tester reliability, differences between testers, whether one's talking, the other one's not talking, if they set everything up, can be a problem. Data processing, whether or not you, you're having the window and the smoothing factors, um, performed. And again, machine inconsistencies. If you're using different machines or you're doing different tests or you have different models or systems, it can give us some, some inconsistencies. And again, one that is interesting is extreme anxiety towards ice kinetic testing. I've actually seen this with some athletes because they've, they've been told so many times that this test is the most important thing for allowing them to go back to sports or their activities. So they're being pushed by their parents, by their coaches, by others. And so they actually develop some anxiety towards ice kinetic testing. Um, all things that we want to kind of pay attention to. So why do we want to test concentric and eccentric modes? Um, for me personally, I have to honestly tell you that I believe that most of our injuries, and we've talked about this, high majority of our injuries occur in the eccentric mode of contraction. And so not paying attention to the eccentric mode in a testing procedure, to me, you're missing 70% of what dysfunction is occurring in, in functional movements. So we have different testing methods. We can do concentric, concentric, or we can do a concentric, eccentric mode. And when we do a concentric, eccentric mode of testing, I, I prefer to do what's called an interrupted stroke sequence. And this was actually developed by Everett Knudsen from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. And what he really found is that, and he, he, was, a, he was a researcher, and by understanding that interrupting that concentric, eccentric, continuous muscle contraction, which we know of as the stretch shortening cycle that we've talked about, that would eliminate the neuromuscular component of the test and give a better indicator of the biological force production. And this is one of the reasons that we often talk about when we look at a test, you know, are we looking at biological factors or are we looking at neurologic factors? And there's ways for us to kind of make a determination if someone just has biological force production issues or if they actually have some neuromuscular issues that we have to pay attention to. And as we talked about in the past, Sometimes the advantage of neuromuscular uh, dysfunction is that we can improve upon that in a very short period of time. So we know that when we start training someone, it takes a average of six to eight weeks for biological force production to occur, for hypertrophy to occur. But neuromuscular uh, control can, uh, can occur in a much faster time frame. So we could see strength improvements within the first one or two weeks if it's a neuromuscular issue 
that we're concerned about. So I go after what we do, and I want to make sure that we have a little bit of a disclosure. Uh, I'm going to be talking about what we do at Proactive Physical Therapy in our test sequence example. So from a disclosure standpoint, I don't want you to use this testing sequence unless you're comfortable and satisfied that it's one of the best things for your patients to be able to use. Uh, you're going to subject them to a higher stress eccentric in order to look at the muscle capacity uh, in, in that motor contraction. And so you want to make sure the patient is deemed appropriate for testing beyond any contraindications or precautions. So if you, if you find something that's a real problem or a contraindication, you probably don't want to test them. The other aspect is you want to make sure that you're introducing a very gentle warm-up in the very beginning. So we start them on a stationary cycle walking on the treadmill for about five to 10 minutes just to increase overall core temperature. And then we do some submaximal specific exercises for that muscle groups. So if it's the quads, I like step downs, mini squats, some of the other types of things that we can do. And during that aspect, we're gonna go through documentation of the subjective information. So we're gonna make sure that we enter the patient's name, obviously, but age, gender, weight, athletic background, if there's a disability or a limb dominance that we need to record, but age and gender and weight are going to be very important because we're going to use body weight uh, specifically to kind of look at some of our data interpretation. And so it's one of those areas that we want to pay attention to. And obviously background, athletic background is going to be important. You know, there's a significant difference, again, as we talked about in training between a running back, a football running back, and a marathon runner. They don't train the same, so we shouldn't expect that we're going to see the same type of force production when we go into an ice connect test. And then Daniel reminded me about this, and, and we talked about this after one of our sequences when he mentioned that I used to have pearls. And my pearl for setups was always make sure when you set the patient up, you align them from proximal to distal alignment. The very last point is the attachment of the pad distally. So you want to take them through that available range of motion. And I know that we're going to kind of talk about this again uh, to make sure that we're, we're sending them through that. We're going to check the alignment after attaching them to the pad through the range of motion, make sure the pad's not pivoting. So it shouldn't be sliding up and down. So if we have aligned the axis of rotation to the axis of rotation correctly, and the chair setup and the patient setup is correct. This is one of our checks and balance systems to make sure that our alignment is correct. So what's our testing sequence? What are we going to do? What's important for us? So let's, let's talk a little bit about tester and subject education and I'll get into some of this. So, you know, familiar instructions a couple of decades ago was to push and pull as hard and as fast as you can. And we've kind of evolved from that original concept or concept reciprocal passive to our current active dynamometers. So subject education regarding how to provide resistance has also transitioned. Because we have higher speed eccentric movements, they can create very high force productions. And while they can be desirable when we're talking about training athletes, they can also be less so if we're working with an average subject. Um, so Requiring modification of verbal cues while testing different subjects with different goals are also important. And then furthermore, if we have inhibition of muscle groups, which are common in untrained individual, especially when we get into higher eccentric force production, it's something all clinicians should be cognitive of. So it's a good common practice to begin assessment and training sessions with good submaximal effort, slow speeds to ensure neuromuscular coordination. Once obtained, the speeds and efforts can be increased for biological force production, and the subject can, can, be, can be more familiar with the various modes of testing. So again, joint alignment and stabilization. Make sure that the lever arm of the unit attaches from the dynamometer head to the resistance pad, and that it's on the lever arm, the way that it should be so that it can record. So again, if it's on the resistance pad, you're going to be recording more force. If it's actually located in, in the uh, loading sequence itself in the dynamometer head, 
you're going to be recording this torque. So regardless of where the load cell is located, it's important to maintain the joint axis of rotation to the dynamometer axis to achieve accurate readings. And again, subject positioning. Position that subject, alignment of the joints both above and below the joint tested to ensure biomechanical alignment <clears throat> through a cardinal plane and that any accessory movement such as rotation is avoided. Kind of common procedure is for us to look at the trunk and proximal joint for initial position stabilization, followed by positioning and aligning the axis of rotation to, of the joint to the to the axis rotation of the dynamometer. And again, the resistance pad is then placed on the distal limb and the subject is taken through the range of motion passively with the machine off to assess for the correct alignment and that there's no pivoting or shifting. It's a really important aspect if we're talking about testing. Once the correct alignment has been established, connect the resistance pad to the distal limb and secure it snugly. So again, when we talk about resistance pad placement, changing the length of the lever arm will influence torque production. So common positioning practices typically report the pad proximal to the medial malleoli by two to the three finger breaths. Uh, but as we move the pad more proximally, we, we do have a tendency to reduce shear stress. And Daniel's talked about that. One other aspect, and we'll get into it when we talk about testing is gravity correction. Uh, and I'm sure Daniel's going to kind of mention this when we go over. Gravity can, uh, correction really encounters a gravitational force that we have to account for under testing conditions. This eliminates gravity-dependent assistance that a muscle group may encounter. So in a typical seated position for testing of the quads and hamstring, the quadriceps are required to lift the weight of the limb against gravity, while the hamstrings are assisted by gravity in pulling down. Uh, especially during a concentric, concentric reciprocal. This gravitational influence can lead to inaccurate increases in measured torque production of the hamstrings while the quadriceps can be re reduced. It's actually been shown in the literature that sometimes the quadriceps force was underreported by 40%, while the hamstring force was overreported by upwards to 500%. So gravity correction is required if ratios are to be used for comparison purposes. And again, most active systems that we're using in today's world have a gravity limited position to assist with any of these corrections. So again, range of motion becomes an important aspect for us to talk about. Uh, when we, we have to have a consistent standardized testing range of motion. And that's appropriate because we want to test and retest for comparison and for normative data collection. So again, the length tension relationship of the muscle to its greatest force production point in the range of motion piece should be assessed during the testing procedures to measure true force production. So if the quad produces the greatest force around 60 degrees, this position is necessary during the testing parameters for accurate muscle capacity to be recorded. So other considerations might be ligamentous restraints and bony alignment configuration, such as the screw home mechanism of the knee. So it's not advisable to perform eccentric testing into the final degrees of, of, of extension or movement when the screw home mechanism is employed. So compatible range of motion for the knee might be minus 10 degrees of extension to about 80 to 90 degrees of flexion. Testing through that 70, 80 degree range of motion, that includes that resting position. Errors can be associated when you change the range of motion parameters of test and retest because it can result in work and power being inaccurately enhanced when the range of motion is increased. So again, number of repetitions. Repetitions require the patient to, to complete a prescribed range of motion established within the, the testing protocol. Multiple repetitions are necessary for, for meaningful comparison of muscle testing. And the establishment of the number of repetitions is dependent on the software and the desired outcome of the test. Most torque measurements are usually accepted between three and five repetitions for measurements for, on, some of the, so, on some of the machines. Others allow for an editing process for each successive repetition to, to obtain maximal effort. So we need at least three maximal repetitions for establishing a coefficient of variance. This allows for a determination of the reproducibility of the number of repetitions measured the smaller the number, the more consistent the repetition measured. 
And really what we want to do is we want to demonstrate that force curves are consistent by a standard of at least 15% or less. I mean, I personally prefer 10%, but 15% is good. And then finally, visual feedback and verbal encouragement. You heard me talk about this a little earlier. Visual feedback has been shown to have a positive effect, but verbal feedback has an incredible capacity to stimulate the neuromuscular system in order to produce a little bit bigger force production. So if we're going to go into early stages, we want to make sure we're teaching the subjects to utilize the information to control resistance. And again, our windowing or our force tracing can be used to assist with appropriate force production. Uh, and then again, an auditory or visitory feedback can also be found to produce greater forces. Verbal encouragement, and this is where I, I used to hear people yelling at the patient when they're producing, uh, can be appropriate guidelines for you know teaching them how to breathe or hand placement or other things. But you want to be careful on how you're going to perform verbal encouragement. Uh, so again, it can be provided on how the subject should perform the test. And doing this during the warm-up and, and procedure is, is actually fairly important. And I choose not to do it as much with the actual test itself. Uh, but there's some controversy, and people like to do that. And then finally, one of the last things to kind of recognize is um, test velocity. So there's multiple speeds that have always been suggested. And in the early days, 60 degrees and 180 degrees per second have always been the norm. Well, some even higher advanced speeds were advocated for an athletic population. So most of the normative data that we have available today was really developed on constant motor testing only. But as the relationships of functional motor loading during activities are explored further and the mode of injury mechanisms are better understood, I mean, several additional interesting parameters begin to appear. So most athletic injuries occur at high rates of speed higher than what the dynamometers can actually produce. We know that pitching, uh, peak angular velocity of pitching can exceed 6,000 degrees per second. Um, but we also see that some su test subjects had difficulty achieving speeds of 300, 400 degrees for testing and training. So it requires us to kind of re-examine appropriate speeds of testing from fast to slow. And as the force velocity curve very clearly shows, the faster one goes concentrically, less force is developed, and subsequently less muscle tension and recruitment of fast twitch fibers. Inversely, however, as speeds of eccentric movement increase, forces increase significantly. This increases tension with rec which recruits fast twitch fibers, beneficial for protection from high speed injuries. But one of the challenges with increasing speeds too quickly with an untrained individual is the, is the neuromotor input, which may inhibit the muscle's force production as a protective mode. So eccentric testing to me becomes important when a clinician wants to perform functional muscle testing and developing a speed of testing that's going to be appropriate for both concentric contraction and eccentric contractions becomes paramount. So do you really need to test at different speeds? or will one speed provide appropriate information regarding force, torque, work, and power? And while no consensus exists within the literature regarding the mode of speed specificity ice connect testing and training, eccentric training at one speed has been shown to increase strength at both faster and slower speeds, further developing the rationale for the need and importance of eccentric training integration in the testing. And so when we talk about testing, I believe it's important for us to really look at the concentric and the eccentric mode. So let's get into this, this testing sequence a little bit. So using manufacturers suggested protocols for testing, as well as dividing, designing your own type of purposes, uh, this is how we might perform an isokinetic muscle group assessment. Once the subject, again, has been deemed appropriate for testing beyond any contraindications or, or precautions. And again, documentation of their age, gender, weight, height athletic ability is going to proceed, and we're going to do a functional warm-up. So again, familiarization with the equipment and proper positioning and stabilization. We want to make sure that they're comfortable and we, we provide reliability for the isokinetic movement so that you know how to test correctly. We want proper position and alignment of the body. So in a standard seated open kinetic position, hip and pelvis alignment is achieved with stabilization belt. 
Thigh length is assessed for appropriate seat length to allow knee flexion without posterior impingement. And then we're going to look at that axis of rotation and make sure it's aligned to the axis of rotation of the joint. Um, we're going to measure that, measure out the length of the lever arm to the distal extremity, and then we're going to move that resistant pad on the lower extremity through the range of motion to make sure that there's no pivoting or shifting occurring. Once we are confident that there's nothing shifting or pivoting on the lower extremity, we can secure that stabilization pad to the subject. We're going to determine uh, if there's going to be a preload. We're going to look at those ramp settings and gravity correction to be performed, and we're going to set the appropriate range of motion for the test. Again, my tests typically go from minus 10 degrees of extension to 80 degrees in the range of motion, so we test through a 70-degree range of motion. We don't get a lot of posterior impingement or artificial breaking when the back of the leg comes against the uh, end of the chair. We do a very specific warm-up, meaning that we want to take them through 10 repetitions prior to doing the test. So after they've done their general warm-up that we talked about before, on the bike, walking, and then uh, doing their step-downs, once they're on the machine, we ask them to give us 25% of their effort for three repetitions. And we're looking at their torque curves and measuring out what level of force they're producing at 25%, then we ask them to give us 50% of effort, and at the same time, we're, we're looking for whether or not they're in distress, they're having any discomfort, or if there's a fatigue factor going on. We're asking them to give us 75% of their effort for three more, and the very last one will ask for 100% effort, and that's what our test is going to be looking like. Now, I normally give them about a minute after we complete this specific warm-up before we go into the testing methods to make sure that they're comfortable with each one of these. So again, we've standardized our testing parameters. We had that specific uh, muscle group warm-up. So we test that uninvolved limb first. And once we've completed our uninvolved limb, then we change for the, uh, for the involved limb. And we make sure that once we finish the test, we've recorded, formatted, and, and we, we look at the interpretation for test results. And we can explain those to the, to the patient and to the physician. And here's an important point. Proper storage of the test for comparative studies in the future becomes really actually important to us. So this is where I'm going to invite Daniel back in. Hello, John. Hello, Daniel. And, and Daniel's given us some great videos that I want you guys to kind of pay attention to. So yeah. I'm going to start. I'm going to start this video. John, let me run this from my end so it won't okay. be choppy. If you could, I can do that. Up, yeah, I'm going to send it back to me. Sounds good, Daniel. And then test quad. All right, so what we're going to show you here is the, the interrupted stroke test for the quad. Uh, we're not doing the hamstring to save time. I've already aligned the patient, set them up in the software. We perform the warm-up familiarization reps. We've hit the gravity correction button. Um, so we're going to get into the actual test reps here. All right, this is the testing screen. We have the torque along the y-axis and the joint angle along the x-axis. On the top left, this box is for the concentric reps, and the bottom box is for the eccentric reps. Now, if you click the next rep button, that'll start your first rep. The zoom button will zoom in on that box and make it full screen, and we'll see that shortly. And then this rep area shows you how many reps you've selected for recording. So you can click the next rep button to begin, and it'll tell you to move to full flexion. Once you're there, tell that patient, on your mark, set, go, and then they start. They push up since we're testing the quad, and they're gonna get full effort all the way through the top of the motion. So I say go, he gives me 100% effort. All right, so then back to the screen. We're gonna to go to the bottom eccentric box, and we're gonna click next rep. So we just record, or we just took our first concentric rep, and you can see it in the top box there. Now I click uh, next rep for the eccentric. And again, he pushes up as the pad moves down. And now you're just gonna go back and forth 
between concentric reps and eccentric reps until you get your three good consistent reps for recording. Now let's check out the zoom feature. Um, this makes it full screen and we can see the peak torque lifted, listed along the left, but the top of the screen, we see the rep colors. So you can see the first rep is red, the second rep is green and so forth. So that's how you can see not just peak torque, but how good your reps are. So let's do another eccentric rep and then we'll zoom in. Now I don't normally zoom in on every rep. I'm just doing that to show you the software a little bit. So you can see that uh, the peak torque on the left there is almost 40 foot pounds less. And you can see how the torque throughout the range is less. And again, that's that work, that total uh, area under the curve. And that's really important. So the first rep was good. So we selected that. And we're going back to concentric. And again, this rep uh, was right between those two. So I'm actually gonna select all three of those reps for a recording. And you can always unselect the rep at any time. So there's our eccentric rep. Let's go ahead and check that out. So we zoomed in again, rep three or the blue line was a good rep. It was consistent with that first one. So I'm gonna click the box next to rep one and three, but I'm gonna leave rep two unselected because that's that green one and I don't wanna, I don't wanna record that. All right, so next, I wanna show you an example of some bad reps. Now this usually happens because they anticipate the bottom of the range early and they stop pushing, uh, usually in their last 10 or 15 degrees. Uh, it can also be that when you click to the uh, next rep button, so yeah, you can see here he pushed, but then he stopped pushing because he anticipated that range of motion stop early. So we don't want to keep that rep. Um, another example here is you tell the patient on your mark and set go, and they kind of stutter step. They give you torque to start it, but then they realize, oh, it's moving. And then they give you force. Again, you don't want to keep that rep. And this is all what's going to help get that coefficient of variance very low. Our coefficient of variance is usually 0.05 or even better. It's rare that with the interrupted stroke test that you have a high coefficient of variance unless there's a reason for it. So let's go ahead and get our last good rep here. And this was a true rep by the patient. So we zoom in, we can see rep six was good. That's our purple rep there. It's got a good peak torque numbers, but the shape of the curve is good. It matches the other, so let's record it. So we got our three good concentric reps, our three good eccentric reps, and then we can move on. Now, I usually make the patient do at least five repetitions, um, even if they give me three good ones out the bat. Lots of times, they will continue getting more and more torque production as they go. You're allowed 10 concentric and 10 eccentric uh, attempts to get three good ones, but I usually at least do five. Um, if they start getting fatigued after that fifth one, I'll give them you know, 30 seconds or a minute rest before I move on. Okay, John, uh, if, you're, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, I didn't know if we are ready to move on back to your screen. Let's do that. Okay, I'm going to throw it back to you, John. Okay, back to you, sir. Thank you, Daniel. So again, when we, when we record those three, then what we want to be able to do is we want to look at the evaluation of that muscle performance and be able to do some interpretation of the four, of those torque curves or those force curves. And again, remor remember that torque can be calculated because it's, it's really force times that rotational movement that's going to be occurring. So maximum force is dependent on the cross-sectional area of the muscle and the type of moment, uh, motor unit recruited. It's also dependent on the distance of the joint and the angle of the insertion. So the shape of the, of the strength curve is dependent on the movement arm and the length tension relationship of each muscle around that joint. So while each muscle group has a, a length tension relationship, optimal strength will, be, will produce the greatest amount of torque. So the point in the range of motion where the movement arm and the length tension relationship combine, they create the most torque uh, available, and that's typically where everyone has recorded peak torque in the past. And again, while peak torque has some validity to it, it's not a great way for us to determine that someone has 
appropriate strength throughout the range of motion. Because again, peak torque is just looking at that one point where that moment arm and the lump tension relationship should combine to create that exact strongest point in the range of motion. So for us, what we should do is look at shapes of curves. And so one of the things for us to realize is that certain muscle groups actually have different shapes to them. So there's, there's groups called ascending, there's groups called descending, and the one we're probably the most familiar with uh, are the ascending, descending uh, force curves. So if you look at hamstrings, hamstrings have a tendency to be more of the ascending strength curves. Shoulder flexors have a tendency to be more descending. And again, the quadriceps or biceps have a tendency to be ascending, descending uh, curves. So what does that really mean to us? Well, again, with a hamstring, maximum strength point should be around 30 degrees of, of flexion. And that as we move into greater modes of flexion, we're going to decrease the amount of force that we're able to produce. Shoulder flexors, um, strength is decreased as shoulder strength or flexion increases. So we have a descending curve. And again, that plateau occurs normally between 40, 45 to 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. And then finally, we have that ascending, descending curve. So again, with the quadriceps around 60, sometimes 70 degrees in the range of motion, should be where we have the highest peak torque. So when we look at the shape of the graph, that becomes important to us to determine whether or not someone has good total work capacity. So what about peak torque? I mean, can we use it? So again, traditionally, it's been the most reported parameter for isokinetic testing, and it's represented by the highest point on the torque curve. But average torque or force may represent the overall work and power to muscle to a higher degree. And the peak torque may not represent the muscle's true capacity. So comparisons of peak torque across different speeds can produce inaccurate conclusions regarding function. Because as we increase our speeds concentrically, our peak torque moves down. So Daniel, should I throw it back to you in order to run this next video? Absolutely. I can go ahead and take it here. Thank you. <clears throat> Hey guys, so every once in a while in doing student presentations, they really don't understand how the torque curve or the force curve is supposed to look like in the clinic. So if you understand what a normal quadricep torque is going to look like, it's going to help us understand data interpretation. So the first thing that we understand is that we go through an ascending, descending curve. So we're going to zoom up on this a little bit. And one of the things that we, we talk about is that our range of motion goes from 0 to 120 on an average quadricep. I know the knee joint range of motion is a little bit more, but muscle range of motion is about that. So at that midpoint in our range of motion is where we should have the strongest amount of force, and we should be actually weakest at our endpoints in our range of motion. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that we go all the way to 0. It depends on whether or not we're giving someone a preload. So if we're talking about going through that range of motion, we kind of see these little Xs. And research has kind of shown us that, that this is the appropriate way that a quadricep is going to respond. So we kind of have that ascending, descending curve that's going to occur. And that's very normal for a quadricep. So one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to start in flexion on a concentric standpoint. So again, if we're measuring out our range of motion to be from 10 to 80 degrees, we're not going to go all the way from this standpoint. We're actually going to start here. And if we're starting low, this is going to ramp up fairly quickly. But what you should see is that this is going to ramp up to kind of catch that point. And then it's going to follow this down. And it's going to stop here and here at our 80 degree point. So we're going to see a ramp up and then we're going to see it kind of track back down. Now, what's different from an eccentric standpoint is we're starting an extension here, but our eccentric measurements should be at least 10 to 30% stronger. And we're going to see those kind of go up following that same mode that the concentric does, but it's going to kind of stop at this point. It's not going to drop all the way to zero because they're still kind of pushing at that point. So we should see that 
concentric contraction is going to be in red. Eccentric contraction is going to be in green. This should be about, this distance here should be about 10 to 30 percent stronger in the eccentric motor contraction. So if we're looking for torque curves, that's what we should be looking for. And that's what we're going to discuss in just a moment. Okay, John, I'm going to send this back your way. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, back to you, sir. So again, what parameters are we going to pay attention to? So when we do a muscle performance, it's a combination of force production, which is biological, and neuromuscular control, which is, brings in the nervous system. So knowing which component or combination of components might be having problems kind of gives us a lead on what's the dysfunctional elements that we need to rehab correctly. So understanding what it should look like, normal versus abnormal curve, and not just the numbers become important to us. So what do we measure? So bilateral comparisons, probably one of the most common uh, comparisons utilizing data analysis to compare one extremity function to the opposite side. And again, differences of 10% are considered normal. Uh, we often say 15% upper limits are normal and anything over 20% is a, a deficit. And that's from the uh, Sapaga uh, research back in 1990. And that has been kind of carried over for a long period of time. The differences of about 10% are considered normal. We often assume that the values of the uninjured limb we're going to utilize as the normal side for comparing to the involved limb. And while some lower extremities don't show a dominant side in testing, uh, some asymmetrical upper extremity sports such as throwing may increase up to 15% over the non-dominant side. So again, the other comparison that we may look at is some agonist versus antagonist reciprocal ratios. So again, ep ipsilateral concentric to concentric ratios have been reported as beneficial despite not really normally functioning in this mode. So again, an example of this is going to be a quadcentric, concentric, hamstring, concentric, reciprocal uh, ratio. And really little evidence suggests that concentric, concentric, reciprocals bear any relationship to success for athletic performance. So variables that influence agonist, antagonist, concentric ratios include the velocity of testing, uh, correction of gravitational effects, as we talked about, joint angle in which the measurement might be taken, and individual differences, such as a sprinter versus a endurance athlete. One of the areas that we may want to look at a little more aggressively is going to be an agonist versus antagonist functional ratio. So a good example of this might be if we want to really look at the quadricep concentric compared to the hamstring eccentric ratio may actually reveal more functional information regarding muscle injury versus concentric concentric alone. And such assessments may be more specific to the mechanism of injury and the mode of the muscle contraction was obtained while sustaining an injury. So for instance, if we talk about a hamstring injury, as the quadricep is kicking out concentrically, the hamstring has to fire at a very quick, sudden deceleration aspect where most of our hamstring injuries occur in. So the hamstring rest, resting length, that left tension relationship we talked about, allows for the greatest development of force at approximately 30 degrees of flexion as it decelerates the concentric quadricep contraction, which we know is significantly stronger overall than what the, the hamstrings are. And in addition to the hamstring force eccentrically, maybe greater at any position in the range of motion than the concentric force, it, it possibly serves as a more functional testing mode than a concentric concentric. So looking at functional ratios may actually help us. Again, I'm a big component of looking at force versus range of motion or the strength curve. Some people call it force curve or a torque curve. And again, if the subject is unable to generate force throughout the entire range of motion, um, you know, you have to be specific about you know, points in the range of motion that cause difficulty. So if you start to see those torque curves changing, um, we're going to look at the differences between the shapes of the curves for the concentric and eccentric modes, and they should be consistent with what research data has shown us. So what we just kind of look at on that last video is really where our, our 
torque curve shapes should look like. So neural inhibition has been shown to occur with increasing speeds during the eccentric contraction, but not during the concentric contractions. So there, there may be an eruption in the force curve that occurs eccentrically, but not affecting the concentric curve. So weaknesses seen when we do both concentric and eccentric curves tend to reflect more of a biological weakness, typically atrophy, whereas a drop in the eccentric curve that does not affect the concentric curve may actually show more of a neurologic inhibition specific to the eccentric mode alone. And that's a real important point. So again, if we have weaknesses both concentrically and eccentrically on that involved side in comparison to the non-involved side, we're looking at a biological weakness atrophy where you're weak both concentrically and eccentrically. But if we see the constant contraction is normal, but there is a dysfunctional eccentric curve that may show that there's a neurologic inhibition that may be occurring. And again, we want to investigate that because when our most injuries are going to occur, when they go into a higher speed eccentric, and if they shut down during high speed eccentrics, that's going to load, lead to the knee having the shift and producing more of a stress to the knee joint itself. So again, endurance is one of those other areas. So several parameters have been suggested. Uh, but again, normal neuromuscular performance is a sub-maximum force produced repetitively. So a lot of endurance testing measures peak torque once it's declined to 50%. Uh, but we may want to reflect a sub-maximal effort rather than a maximal effort if we're looking at that. And again, total work actually over a period of time may be more valuable assessment for endurance testing. And again, a lot of these active machines actually have an endurance protocol developed within the test modes. And then finally, when we talk about peak torque to body rate ratio, this is a comparative value for individualizing the interpretation of an ice connect test to, 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 to compare it to a subject's body weight. So this allows for comparison between subjects of different sizes. So lean muscle mass has always been suggested as comparative ratio, but most manufacturers utilize total weight, body weight for comparison. So if we have two people and they, they give us the same uh, force curves, say at 150 pounds, but one person is 150 pounds and the other person is 300 pounds, at 150 pounds, that's normal, that's a normal torque curve to peak torque, we're at a 300 pound ratio, we'd say they're 50% of where they should actually be. So again, normal versus abnormal torque curves, um, it's, it's, it's been discussed whether or not they can be diagnostic in nature, but really what we're measuring is the determination of really force or torque, work and power. Um, so, you know, there's discussion whether certain artifacts in the curve may allow for differential diagnosis, uh, as such as anterior knee pain, ligamentous injuries. But what we really haven't established in scientific literature is to truly validate these. So our interpretation of torque curves really are dependent on the ability or lack of to produce really force, work, or power. And again, misconceptions. Other misconceptions regarding data analysis has to do with speeds of testings. Slow speed tests do not determine strength and fast speeds do not determine power. Torque, work, and power are all, all independent of test velocities, and they can be calculated at any speed. So we need to kind of pay attention to those performance parameters and the ways that we want to look at those. So again, ice connect exercise, we're looking at ascending, descending curves. Typically, we're looking at 100% of maximal muscle capacity as we go through. And again, from a velocity of movement standpoint, if we talk about force velocity curve, the faster we go concentrically, the less force we develop, the faster we go eccentrically. By keeping the speeds within a relative uh, mode that's comfortable for the patient, I utilize 60 degrees uh, per second for our testing method through an 80 degree range, 70 degree range of motion. I believe that it's a very comfortable mode, and we talked about speeds associated with that in the past. So let's go back to Daniel to kind of talk a little bit about uh, the, the force curves, the torque curves that he, he got from his patients. So John, what I'm actually gonna do, because um, we're running at the top of the hour, 
I'm going to go ahead and throw these videos. Uh, I'm going to uh, narrate them and do a voiceover uh, like I would do if we, if we had time. But I'm going to throw them up on my YouTube channel. And uh, we'll do two things. One, I'll have, uh, I'll have Rob send that out in an email blast. Uh, two, I'll provide the link in uh, next month's webinar. So that way, if you, know, if you didn't get a chance to get it through the email, or for some reason Rob got busy and he forgot to send it out, you will get that um, in next month's webinar, just like what I did in episode seven, when I sent out the uh, seven or eight, uh, six, when I sent out the YouTube links for the previous ones we didn't get to finish. That way uh, we can get to it. And I, what I did is I broke down a test, an interrupt stroke test, uh, very detailed and also kind of what it meant for the patient and how that patient progressed through uh, through a series of tests. So be on the lookout for that. Um, now, John, I actually have a question for you that came with one of our uh, viewers regarding speeds. Now, you just told us that you like to use 60 degrees per second for your testing speed for your, uh, for your knee patients. What about your uh, shoulders and your ankles? What speeds do you recommend for those joints? Uh, depends on the range of motion that you're going through. And again, what we had talked about in the past, um, and this was a process that I kind of developed and it's called one degree per degree range of motion. So most people who have normal neuromuscular function can respond well to about one degree per degree range of motion. Slowing it down just a little bit may make it a little more functional. So it depends on what you're testing in the shoulder. If you're testing, uh, say, the rotator cuff, um, you know, I'm normally testing in a 70 degree range of motion also through that range of motion um, or a little bit longer. So, you know, I, I'm going to stop them a little short of full, extent, uh, full external rotation 90 degrees and I'm going to bring them into internal rotation a little bit. So 60 to 70 degrees uh, is a very appropriate if we're going through a 90 degree range of motion. Uh, anything up to 90 degrees. If my ankle range of motion is, is about 30 degrees that I'm testing in, so anything between 20 to 30 degrees can be very functional. 15 degrees would give you two seconds going out concentrically, two seconds going back eccentrically, um, depending on not whether or not you've trained that person so they don't have an inhibition. And uh, John, I have one last question, um, and we'll get into this in the upcoming, when we, when we do our putting it all together case studies. How do you know when a patient walks in, whether you want to test them with an uh, eccentric interrupted stroke test versus the, uh, the isometric test that I covered last month? Well, I think time frame is going to be part of it. It's function and what they're able to do. It's pain response. It's whether or not they have full range of motion. and that that in giving us, you know, I can put them on the machine uh, during the warm up and actually perceive whether or not they're having any dysfunction during that 25%, 50%, 75%. And again, if, if I'm noticing that they're having uh, increasing inhibition, uh, fatigue, uh, pain that is really causing them problems, uh, I'll stop the test and I'll, I'll kind of bring them back to a different type of testing mode, such as isometric. Um, Certainly. So there, there's, there's a couple of different factors, but one very important factor is whether or not they've been trained a little bit in eccentric mode uh, so that they actually perform eccentrically correctly. Uh, certainly, I, I agree with you there. Also, patient presentation. Obviously, if they're having, you know, seven out of 10 pain through normal ADLs, they're not going to, you're not going to throw them on a maximum effort eccentric no, mode. Not, not you might isometric but if the person comes in and they're saying oh, I get pain when I play basketball or you know every once in a while going downstairs but I'm able to push through it then we'll throw them on the eccentric load test because uh, their pain is much less and their function is much higher so a lot of it is with that and, and that's going to give us a good indication and again you know if they're giving us hundred percent of their perceived effort we're going to really see uh, where in the range of motion they might be having deficits we're going to see the uh, difference between the concentric and eccentric force production of the uninvolved to involve limb, and that can give us a lot of good information, mm -hmm. especially with anterior knee pain patients. When we see they have normal concentric-concentric test, but they have horrible eccentric 
tests in relationship to the well, uninvolved side. Uh, the, screen that, the screen you ended up on is what I'm actually going to cover in that video that I'm going to send. And if you take a quick glance at that, you'll notice that right side of graph, that's the eccentric. That red line shuts down pretty aggressively. So It does. I'm going to, I'm going to send that to you guys again. I'm going to put that together tomorrow, throw it up on my YouTube, and Rob can email the link out. Plus, I'll also include it in next month. Well, John, thank you very much. Rob, thank you very much. And I appreciate everybody watching. And stay tuned for uh, next month when we cover the standard isokinetic concentric concentric test. Fantastic. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Good night.